Hallelujah, saints. Amen. So good to have our brother with us today. Um, little, little history. Back in uh, what, 1998, Brother Howard Agushi was here with us, and he was heading to Memphis, uh, Tennessee, for two months, and then he was going to come back and be with us for one month on a three-month rotation. And one of the brothers said, uh, Brother Howard, uh, how are the brothers going to go on here? He said, well, I'll just be a phone call away. And then he also said this. He said, uh, if you need help, call Brother Minoro for Long Beach. So uh, we call Brother Minoro many times. And, uh, and one, one other quick anecdote. The other day we called him with a, an issue we had. And we were on Zoom with him, and he said, Brother, he said, so good to see you. He said, uh, you know, you don't have to wait till you have problems to call me. Uh, and uh, so from that, issued this mini conference. So praise the Lord. Our brother asked us if we would uh, read a couple of verses, three verses. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. So if you could uh, put those up and we can read those together. Colossians 3, 15 and 16. Ready? And let the peace of Christ arbitrate in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to God. And then chapter 4, verse 2. Persevere in prayer, watching in it with thanksgiving. Okay, hold on now. Yeah. All right, thank you. Well, thank you for the very kind introduction. Uh, and uh, every time I step in here, or actually I, I drive close to this hall, I do always remember my brother uh, Howard. <clears throat> and uh, even recently, I, I forgot on what occasion uh, I was telling some brothers, younger brothers, who wouldn't know Howard, you know, maybe, maybe not the other, not even heard of his name, much less uh, having met him. <clears throat> and uh, so I told him, uh, told him a few things. Amongst them, uh, of course, number one, how he is, he was uh, absolute for the ministry. The ministry of the Lord in his recovery. <clears throat> and uh, that minute, that absoluteness was shown, uh, confirmed in his um, continual, continual, um, steadfast, um, um, himself and then leading others to uh, get into the Word of God with the help of the life studies. And uh, I say this not in any derogatory way. You have to believe me. Uh, I said, I just remember how he got his chicken scratch on his Bible. He would have this triple zero fine pen that, that in little small writing that I couldn't even read. You know, even with my glasses. And there he was writing down either copying or his own notes. I, I, I do not know sometimes, I don't know what's really here. I surely like to uh, take a look at his Bible again. And, uh, and he would just write and write and filling these pages. Um, and how he led many of you in, uh, in Long Beach 
to just get into those life studies in a, uh, in a uh, regular way. <clears throat> and I think many of you can testify, especially the brothers, how that has become the great source of salvation uh, and, and, and uh, uh, solidity um, <clears throat> in the, for your church life. And so uh, I cannot forget that. Of course, uh, many of know, uh, you know that how much he was a singer and a, a player of instruments and writer of songs. And <clears throat> uh, I don't know today how many songs out there are written by Howard. I think that some of them are quite um, popular. And, um, but I was told that actually uh, I may be wrong that he had written or he had um, um, set the entire book of song songs to music, the whole book of song songs. But what so what we are what we have is not, not all of what how it had written, only part of it. So um, and tonight we have a verse here concerning <clears throat> singing with grace in your hearts to God that is related to the inhabiting of the world. Singing is related to the inhabiting of the world. It's not just singing in, in that simple sense, but singing to allow the word or to receive the indwelling word. The fact of the matter is that until the word becomes your song, that word is still not dwelling in you adequately, if I may say so. So um, that shows how much our brother loved the word of God and how much the word is living in him. So there are other things uh, concerning our brother I, uh, that I remember, but anyway, I just mentioned that to some of the brothers I was with. <clears throat> he passed on the year that was exactly after Brother Lee died. And that would be, am I correct? I think I'm, I think I'm right. 98 Thanksgiving yes. season when uh, uh, no, I think I, yes, I'm right, yeah. Okay. Um, Anyway, I miss him very much. Uh, tonight, uh, I have the feeling to actually re-speak um, the message that I gave recently at the International uh, Elders and Responsible Ones training, what we call ITERO or ITERO or whatever, uh, just about a month ago. And uh, the verses that you read, which is these three verses in Colossians, from the second part of Colossians, um, come, um, are the basis for the burden in that message. That message is called, Allowing the Peace of Christ to Arbitrate in Our Hearts. That's number one. There are three points. This is number one. The second point is letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly. And then the third point is persevering in prayer for the genuine church life. Now, talking about the genuine church life, I come back to Long Beach again. I, I study Long Beach, you know. <clears throat> Recall back in the at the latest in the very early 90s, Brother Witness Lee actually came here, maybe for the first and the last time. Do any of you recall there was a conference in Long Beach? I think 1990 or 91. And the, he gave only one message in my memory. And that became a very famous message. It's actually in the book. 
It's called a genuine church. See here? A genuine church. Like that is called a genuine church. Surprise, surprise, that genuine church that Brother Lee talked about is probably the worst church in the New Testament on record. And I'm talking about the church in Corinth with all of its 11 terrible problems. I would never call that a genuine church, but you have to uh, pay attention to the word genuine. It does not say the perfect church, does it? Because Corinth is far, far from that. No, but even with its myriads of problems, serious problems, I mean starting with division, to fornication, to eating food, uh, idolatrous food, to um, um, brothers suing each other in heathen courts, to um, uh, the heresy of no resurrection. I mean, you name it, they've got it, okay? It, it was a terrible church, I would call it. But nevertheless, in the first nine verses of 1 Corinthians, Brother Lee made what? An indisputable case that this church is genuine. Isn't that an encouraging? I don't think Long Beach is anywhere close to Corinth. I don't think so. And I don't want to get into that, but I do want to say this word to the young brothers and sisters among us here in Long Beach, that you must read that message. Just get that book. I don't know how many times I read it. Uh, it's one of those books that just you want it to be close by. That will give you an elevated view concerning the church, not according to your view your judgment, your valuation, because we tend to have natural eyes to see the church as it is, so bad or so, whatever it is. But those nine verses lifts you up to the heavenlies to see the church from that angle. And that church is the church of God, which was in Corinth. And together with those in that area who were calling on the name of the Lord, this Christ is both theirs and ours. In fact, in that book covering this awful church, Christ is unveiled in his all-inclusiveness like in a few other books in the New Testament. <clears throat> uh, from Christ being the portion of the sins, the wisdom of God, <clears throat> uh, our uh, righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption as our feast, right? unleavened feast as our spiritual rock uh, which is our spiritual drink and all the way i don't know the time i think at least 15 items and the very last one was absolutely like the knockout and that would be the last adam became a life-giving spirit my goodness my goodness Christ was unveiled against such a uh, horrible background. <clears throat> and these saints, there, though they are beset by all kinds of problems, the Greeks among them, the Jews among them, some look for drawn to philosophies, others are into, into miracles and power, and they all are seeking gift in a wrong way. It's a mess. It's a messy situation. But Paul took the time in this long 
epistle to perfect to help them. I mean, he was even there right in the epistle, said, I'm present in the spirit to judge the sinner, a sinner in that church. He was that bad. But nevertheless, Paul never gave up because that was the church of God. <clears throat> and uh, now, in this topic of this message tonight, these three things, these three things I want you to pay attention. These three things, number one, letting or allowing the peace of Christ to arbitrate. Arbitrate means to be the referee, uh, to be the uh, one who make the call, to be uh, the final judge, to be the decision maker. Um, let, we are to have a genuine church life to let, to allow the peace of Christ, this thing called the peace of Christ, which as we will see is simply Christ himself as our peace. To arbitrate, to be the arbitrator in our hearts in all things, in our relationship, in, in, in our disputes, in our conflicts, in our whatever, all the issues that we may have in the church life, in decisions that need to be made, this or that, that there's only one person who rules, who reigns, who governs, not by force, not by the force of argument, not because someone has a better argument, surely not, by who's right and who's wrong, but by something called peace. Peace rules. Peace governs. This church life is the genuine church life. And number two, this church life is based on or built up by another factor. And this second factor is another let, another allowing, another cooperation on our part, and that is to allow the word of Christ. There's first the peace of Christ, and then the word of Christ to dwell in us richly. Oh, I just love this. You know, ever since I gave this message, this message, I think because I gave it, I have to get into it more than others. Um, this matter of the peace of Christ and this matter of the word of Christ and specifically not just the word of Christ but the indwelling word of Christ, the inhabiting word of Christ, the abiding word of Christ. We are to let this word of Christ dwell in us, live in us like a person, rich and in all wisdom. Tonight, these points that I'm giving to you in this message are all the crucial points so that we can have a what? A strong and a rich and a peaceful and harmonious and thus a genuine church life. These are the key factors. The last point uh, that is in chapter 4. It is the perseverance in prayer. The perseverance in prayer. To continue steadfastly in prayer in all perseverance. And of course, I think we all know that prayer life, our prayer life, is such a um, necessary indispensable support for us to have uh, a genuine church life. So don't go away forgetting any of these three points, right? The peace of Christ, the word of Christ, and prayer. But these three things, especially the first two, were presented in a somewhat of a particular way 
in the book of Colossians. Now, in the book of Colossians, let me just kind of remind you, there are, besides the introduction and the final conclusion or salutation, it's really mainly two parts. This, this very, very great book, a sister book of Ephesians, where um, the book of Ephesians covers or unveils or reveals mainly the body of Christ, the church, and the book of Colossians mainly reveals the head of Christ, the headship of the Lord. So the first part of this book of Colossians, roughly from chapter 1 verse 9 to chapter 3 verse 11, actually reveals to us the uh, the preeminence and the all-inclusiveness of this Christ of God, who is the centrality or the center and the universality that is the entire periphery, the center and the what? And the entire universe of God. So, you want to know God? You want from center to circumference, it's Christ. Um, this one was marvelously, just, just marvelously um, displayed or shown to us as these things. I'm just going through them quickly. The portion of the saints, the image of God and the firstborn both in creation and in resurrection, right? In the old creation and the new. Number three, he is the mystery of God's economy. And number four, he is the mystery of God himself. Then he is the body, the body, the reality, the substance of all the shadows, all the things, the, the reality of all things. Is Christ. We are not here promoting pan, pantheism, okay? But the reality of all the things, all the positive things in the universe are simply Christ. The real Son is not the Son, it's Christ. Am I right? And so um, everything that is positive, all the types in the Old Testament that are positive, all points to this. Christ of God. Don't we love him, brothers and sisters? Don't we worship him? We're here because of Christ, and we're here uh, just loving him and pursuing him, and we're here just to be filled with him. That's all that God desires. This is my beloved. Hear him. He is the life of the saints. He is our life. Christ who is our life. This is our real life. And finally, he is the constituents of something called the new man, which is the what God purposed to gain on the earth not just men, not just men as individuals, surely not the old Adam who eventually degraded and fell into sin. Of course not. God is after gaining a new man out of this old man on this earth and indeed in this universe. And Christ is the unique constituent of this new man. In this new man, there's no Jew, there's no Greek, there's no Americans, there's no Mexicans, there's no Chinese, there's no Koreans, there's no class structures, there's no slaves or free men, and there's no cultural element there, there's no uh, sophisticated people, there's no barbarians. All these things, all these things that today divide our society, you agree with me? Right. Racial differences, 
class struggles, uh, even age group against age groups, ideological differences, all of these things have no place in this new man that Christ created on the cross when he died there. In this new man is only Christ. Amen. Everything else is replaced. Everything else is replaced. <coughs> now after he said these things, Paul came to the second part of this book. A couple of chapters. Second half of chapter 3. And a few verses in chapter 4. Here Paul and these three verses that we cover today uh, fall into this uh, section. And this section, after Paul has unveiled so uh, marvelously this all-inclusive Christ <clears throat> who is everything in God's economy and everything in the church. He talks about our living, how we should live with this revelation. I mean, all this is not just for us to appreciate, to merely understand. Um, no, all of this is for us to live the church life today. So here in Long Beach, what kind of church life should we have? Now we are all coming out slowly out of this thing called the pandemic, right? We're beginning to meet in person. We're sort of coming back, if you will, to this kind of a church life where we are physically with one another. I'd like to challenge you all tonight, as I challenge myself, that don't say and don't think, uh, let's let's go back to three years ago you know you know what i'm saying let's call this three years a nightmare right we just had a terrible nightmare so we're gonna pick up where we left off tonight i'd like to issue a strong challenge to the church in long beach don't do that we're not going to go back we are going forward. Yeah. Let's look for a new church life. Yeah. A richer, stronger, and more genuine church life. Yeah. I think we should do that. Yeah. We should do that. And so I think these three points, or these points here, in this message, will help us greatly. How to establish, how to build up such a church life in the Lord's recovery today. And in this, in this, uh, mainly are these three points. Now, with that as a background, <laughs> I know time is short, I would like to cover these matters with you briefly. Now you say, what are you going to talk about tomorrow morning? Because I'll be here if you let me. Um, tomorrow, I have a very good outline, a special one that you have never seen. And uh, that I have never given, used it to give any message. It's a new outline. And this outline zeroes in, in fact, on the matter of peace. And I think the title is, help me out, um, the, uh, here, please read it. Yeah, our peace in and for the body line. Can you say this in Spanish for our piercings? So tomorrow, 
I have a particular burden to zero in on the matter of peace. On the matter of peace. It's a long outline. Two pages, but packed. And uh, as he said, um, it is on enjoying Christ as our peace in and for the body life, which is the reality of our church life today, or should be. All right, now let's come to uh, these uh, verses. Oh, I just love, love these scriptures. <clears throat> you know, after Paul talked about the new man, where there cannot be any person or anything or any matter, but Christ is all, meaning Christ is all its constituents. Christ is all its, the members of this new man. And in all, that means Christ is in every one of us as members of this new man. So after he said that, he talked about putting on, therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, inward parts of compassion, kindness, loneliness, meekness, long-suffering, bearing one another and forgiving one another. If anyone should have a complaint against anyone, even as the Lord forgave you, so also should you forgive. And over all these things, that, that means all these virtues, I just, this litany of virtues that the apostle laid out, over all these things, put on love. Like, it's like the trees, huh? they have layers and layers of clothing. So all these things you put on like garments, you put it on you like clothing, one after another. But on top of all of this, you have to put on the final piece of clothing. And that piece of clothing is simply love. Which is the uniting bond of perfectness. I don't have the time to get into these things. I may refer back to it in a moment. I just want to read this still. Uh, these verses that precede this verse 15 concerning the peace of Christ arbitrating in our hearts. I use the outline. You don't have it here. It's okay. I'm not going to kind of like develop every single point. It's primarily just to release the burden within. <clears throat> the first thing you say is to have a proper, genuine church life is for every one of us to let the peace of Christ arbitrate in our hearts. You may not think this is the first thing, but tonight I want to tell you this is the first. There would be no way for us to practice the church life to experience the body life if we do not have peace. If there is discord among us. If there will be a lack of harmony in our midst. Now tomorrow, we're going to say more concerning this peace, to define it, to accentuate it. And you would be more impressed. But tonight, I would just state this as a fact. As a fact. So in Paul's uh, salutation, uh, in fact, not only he, but the other apostles as well, grace and peace to you all. Grace and peace to you all, as if you don't need anything else. If you have grace, you have peace, that's good enough. That's what you need. 
And needless to say, there are just too, too many verses in the New Testament on grace. And I think many of us might have studied that. But tonight, I'd like to point your attention not to grace, but to peace. How many of you have studied that? How much peace was mentioned, is mentioned in the New Testament? Related to our personal life as a Christian, and especially related to our corporate life as the church. The peace is so important. This peace is not man-made. This peace is not artificial. This peace is not uh, temporal. This peace is not just we agree on everything, right? This peace is not just hugging and kissing. This peace is called the peace of Christ. The Lord said before he went to the cross, my peace I give to you. Not like the peace that is in the world. Would you not agree with me today, despite all the hopes and dreams and activism even, to bring about some semblance of peace on the earth? Today, there is less peace, rather more enmity, am I right? More walls, more differences, more antagonisms, more hatred between people in the same country, in the same neighborhood. When the Lord was born, the angels came to the shepherds, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. Amen. The coming of Christ, the incarnation of the of, of God, of this Savior of mankind, is not just to bring glory to the heavens, but peace to men on the earth. Amen. And look, ultimately, in the divine revelation, the last of all signs and prophecies and visions is a city called the New Jerusalem. And what is the New Jerusalem? What does the word Jerusalem mean? It means the foundation of peace. Salem in Hebrew simply means peace, shalom. And Jerusalem means the foundation of peace. That city is built on peace. Amen. Without peace, there is no Jerusalem. There's no new Jerusalem. Without peace, the church life has no foundation. So the first thing, brothers and sisters, we need to pay attention to is the peace among us. Amen. But this peace, I say again, is not something you can manufacture that you can just bring to the table. You're just a good guy. You can get along with everyone. No, there'll be a day soon you cannot get along with somebody. There's only one peace in this universe and that is, his name is the God of peace. In the Bible, such a particular designation, that's a name, is used Numer many times, six, seven times, not the peace of God, but the God of peace, Amen. meaning peace and God are the same. Amen. There is no peace apart from God himself. Amen. And this God today is the triune God. 
And the centrality and universality of this God is simply our dear Christ Jesus. And so today, this peace is actually Christ. When we talk about let the peace of Christ arbitrate, we're saying let Christ arbitrate. This peace is a person. When the Lord on the night of resurrection came among the disciples in the upper room, he breathed into them the Holy Spirit, which is he himself, through death and resurrection being transfigured to be the spirit of life to come into his disciples to live in them. And after he did that reading, he said, Peace be unto you. The result of Christ dwelling within us is peace. Remember the day when you received the Lord? There is that unspeakable peace. You don't know where it comes from. You didn't have a particularly good day. But you just have this indescribable sense of tranquility, of serenity, am I right? Of peace from some other source. Amen. You may come home and your wife is still gagging at you, but you have that peace. Amen. Or your husband, I shouldn't just say your wife. Amen. Outwardly is what I'm saying. Things are about the same. But there's something inside and I tell you that is God that is Christ now we need to all allow this is the word let 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 implies let means you have to do something I said I think I said in this message this let is not a passive let this let is a aggressive let you have to cooperate. You have to allow it. I mean, here's an arbitrator. Here's someone to help you, but you just want to keep him out. You don't let him in. You don't let him function. Still, it doesn't do you any good. We need to let, oh dear brothers and sisters, let. Yeah. How about we put a big LET on that wall <laughs> for several weeks, huh? Maybe on that side, let the peace of Christ arbitrate Amen. in your hearts. This side, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. How about that? We start our new church life with two lets. Shall we? Let us let. Let us let. Let the peace. Not just let Christ. Let the peace of Christ arbitrary in our hearts starting with my heart and your heart you let the peace arbitrate peace of christ arbitrate in your heart now the greek term very quickly for this word arbitrate means umpire that means a referee the one who decides you know whether you follow it or not and, you know he has his own rules. You, 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 don't, you don't argue with the umpire, right? He has the final word. He is he's the decider of everything. I like to tell you, brothers and sisters, if we would all let the Lord decide everything in our lives, we'll be a very peaceful people. The problem is we don't let him. And we assume the place. I decide. I want to do this. I make the call. I'm the boss. The moment you do this, trust me, your life will go slowly, sometimes quickly, into a tailspin. You'll be messed up. I have plenty of experiences. I was about to say something and inwardly the umpire said no. I said, who are you? 
So I still say it. I tell you, before I finish my sentence, I already, the regret set in already. I said, oops, should have done that. Should have followed the arbitrator. You follow me? You say, this is very practical, very real in our personal lives, in our marriages. Marriages, brothers and sisters. Start with our marriage. You say the church life, the church life starts with your marriage, those who are married. And start with our own personal lives. Do we really let, do we really enthrone the peace of Christ? Amen. Is he on the throne within us? Does he make the decision for everything? This peace, when we let this peace arbitrate and have the final say within us, you know what it does? It dissolves, it dissolves, it melts away all our complaints, all our unhappy feelings, all our even offenses. It just melts it away. This, let this person settle the dispute. You know, I've been during the pandemic with some other brothers, co-workers, serving a church somewhere in the earth I didn't mention. And they found themselves over many years uh, in, after many years, um, in a impossible situation. By that I mean the leading ones, you know, the elders, and the responsible ones, are of two camps. And despite all the fellowship and help and exhortation and whatever, nothing worked. Why? Because the offense, the antagonism is just too deep, too deep, and I've been there for too long. And basically, we throw all our hands. And eventually, I myself came to realize that really something like this no one can help. It's not coming and do a surgery or something, you know? It, you, it's so deep seated. It's like those clans in Scotland, you know what I mean? After, after centuries, they're still fighting. They even forgot why they fought. They just want to fight. Because your last name is that and my last name is this. It's kind of like that. And so all I could do is pray that these dear, dear brothers, dear brothers, all of dear brothers, really dear brothers, would find their arbitrator, which happened to be the same one person in all of us. Let him settle all these inner disputes and inner differences. Whenever we find there's something rising up within us to argue, to quarrel, to disagree, to fight, to do whatever. Sometimes even just the tiniest feeling. You didn't take action, but there's just certain thing rising up. That's the time to give the place, the first place, and say, Lord, the peace of Christ, I enthrone you. Right now, I let you be the arbitrator. I let you preside as the peace in this situation. And when the Lord can do that in all of us, I tell you, 
there would be peace among us and there would be the church life. So we do need to let, let by putting aside or putting on the cross or applying the cross to our opinions, our um, concepts, our preferences, all these things that is just tearing the world society apart today. And all of us together listen to the word of this indwelling referee, the peace of Christ. It's not an easy lesson to learn, but it can be learned. And I trust that if we would do this, the church here would be in a atmosphere, would be in an environment where there will be building up. Absolutely, there will be building up. This peace that we have are of two directions. One, vertical, and that is our peace with God. So another direction, that is the horizontal direction, and that is peace between the members of the body. And to this Christ, who is the arbitrator, uh, that brings in the peace, will bring in the peace in these two directions, both directions. Look, when we don't have peace with God, it's hard for us to have peace with man. But the contrary is also true. If we, if I don't have peace with Rob, it's a problem. I tell you, it's hard for me to have peace with God. Experience. Am I right? So these two, ver vertical or horizontal, they are linked together. I pray that today uh, in all the local churches, for sure here in Long Beach, that this would be a real church, a genuine church that is preserved in such peace, such oneness, such harmony. And the word actually in Matthew 18 is a symphonic harmony. Harmony like in a symphonic orchestra. When there is this kind of atmosphere and condition, oh, brothers and sisters, the body life will appear. Amen. The body life will appear among us. You know, I really believe that today despite all the anti-God, anti-gospel, anti-work, uh, uh, Bible, all these things, people inside actually are all seeking and looking for a place where people can really be at peace. I mean, really. Where there's no argument, where there's no uh, disputes, Why? Because the, this place is a place where only one person has the final say. One person makes the final decision. And because all of us, as parts of this new man, all keep ourselves under the ruling of this enthroned peace. Oh, tomorrow I'll say more. You know Isaiah 9-6, you know the famous Isaiah 9-6. Um, the son will be, um, the child will be born, the son will be given, and you know, his name will be uh, the mighty God, the 
eternal father, etc. And at the end it says he will be the counselor, right? And then what? The last thing. The prince of peace. Notice peace here is related to rule. Peace here is related to government. Peace here is related to a throne. Peace is related to the kingdom. Romans 14 says the kingdom of God, meaning the church life today in reality, is what? Righteousness and what? Peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Without peace, there is no kingdom of God. The kingdom of God's first characteristic is it's peaceful. It's filled with peace. And all of us should be the peace makers, just like Christ was on the cross. He made peace, and when he created the one new man. Today, let us let this peace rule within us. Actually, my time is kind of up already. Um, but let me just quickly, uh, just a few minutes, cover the, the second point. Uh, and that is the second most important thing, may I say, for a genuine church life is another let. That is to let the word of Christ dwell in you which firstly let the peace of Christ arbitrate in our hearts. Number two, let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. This simply means what? That we need to cooperate with the living Word of God. <clears throat> the Word of Christ is not only just the words that Christ himself spoke. Of course it includes that. That's the four Gospels. But in the New Testament, God speaks in Son, according to the book of Hebrews. That means that Son is not only the individual Son, Jesus Christ, but that son is the corporate sonship of God that includes all of us who are the regenerated many sons of God. God today in the New Testament three, speak through the head and his body. The only begotten who became the firstborn and all the believers who are the many begotten sons of God. God speaks through this son. And therefore in the New Testament all the writings of the apostles that became the apostles teaching all of those are part of the word of christ and today as we speak this word as we expound this word as we interpret this word as we proclaim this word we are also speaking the word of christ we need to let this word dwell in us richly. Let me just get to the point very quickly. The burden that became so great within me since this message was given was that this word wants to dwell. This word is not just for study. This word is not just for examination. This word is not just for your research. This word seeks to dwell in you like a person moving into a house, a residence, and live there, and dwell there. This is, <coughs> brothers and sisters, the need today. We have the Bible, we have so many wonderful spiritual writings and books, you name it. And these days we are very much promoting the life studies 
of the Bible. We have it all. We have all these things. But the need I submit today, especially in the Lord's recovery with all, and inundated, literally, with all these riches, is how much that word, how much has that word succeeded in dwelling in you, in moving in you, in moving into you, in inhabiting you. Now this is a big subject all in itself. I recently I I want to write a series of outlines on the indwelling word. I just sat there and just I right away I have 20 points. Um, this is a actually a very big subject. You know the Lord says in uh, in uh, John 15, abide in me, right? And I in you. This talk about the mutual indwelling between Christ and us. Then several verses later, abide in me, but this time he says something else. And my words abide in you. So you can see the Lord's abiding in us is made practical by his words abiding in us. If his word, the Lord's word, is not living, abiding, inhabiting, taking over your inward parts, then don't tell me Christ is making home in you, right? The verse in Ephesians 3, Paul's second major prayer, you know, that Christ would make his home in us. How does Christ make his home in us practically? By his word, by actually himself becoming the word or being the word, the rhema word, the instant word, the living word. Because of your letting, because of your cooperation, because of the way you take in the word, this word start to abide in you. And that abiding in you will bring forth all manners of wonderful things, wonderful things. In your own daily life, you will be rich. You, 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 won't, you don't feel hollow, you don't feel empty. You feel full because the word somehow made it inside of you. The outward word, this word, this Bible, this marvelous word of God, this black and white, is no longer black and white, neither is it just something that you have retained in your head, which is not bad, I'm not against it, but I'm saying not only. This word somehow finds its way deep into your hearts. In fact, inhabiting it, making home. There are two words. The making home in Ephesians is even stronger. This kata, this dwelling in you. This word is not as strong, but the meaning is the same or similar. Young people, I want to challenge you because many of us my age, we grew up with the help of praying the word, you know what I mean. Actually allowing the word to abide and inhabit us. Sure, we learn a lot of truth. We learn a lot of necessary knowledge in the word of God. We need that, absolutely. We need that. But the stress here is let the word inhabit inhabit you. I don't need to go through, go, go through all the uh, functions of the word, all these marvelous functions of the word. I mean, let me just mention this, the word, this word, huh? this, this Bible, it enlightens us, doesn't it? Yes. 
I mean, I mean, when you have just no word for one day, you feel dark. I mean, be honest, right? You just feel dark. But when you have the word of God, you just feel just something, something is shining. There's light there. This word, needless to say, nourishes you. When you don't have the word of the Lord in you, you, you feel malnourished. You, you feel, you feel wrong. You feel dissatisfied. This word is like water that quenches our thirst. This word strengthens us, no doubt about it. The word strengthens us. This afternoon, I visited Brother Dan Leslie, who is at home and uh, he hardly could speak so much. This is a brother from Cyprus, right? And uh, and I was there just, just sitting there, you know, with him for, for a little bit. And eventually I realized that he was actually not sleeping. He was actually awake, could hear. And uh, so I said a few words to him. I didn't say anything, you know, this or that. I said, Brother Dan, do you mind me sharing with you something the Lord spoke to me in, in the Bible, in the Word? And I proceeded to speak to him. He was just eyes closed. And the fact is, these days, uh, <clears throat> through some study, the Word in Hebrews came alive to me. In what chapter? specifically chapter 11, 12, and 13. And more specifically in those three chapters, the repeated mentioning about us, the faith people. Amen. You know, we are the faith people. Because our Father is the first ancestor of faith. This is even pre-law. This is before the age of the law. It's the age of promise and the age of faith. So we are all the children and sons of this Abraham. Amen. The Jews are the earthly seeds, we are the heavenly seeds of this Abraham. And there, when it talks about Abraham, when it talks about Sarah, it talks about uh, Isaac and Jacob, and so on. It talks about how they consider themselves strangers and sojourners on this earth. Look, you know, Abram was called out of the Ur of Chaldee, you know, Babylon, the old Babylon. He was called out of that to go into the promised land of Canaan, right? The good land. And he arrived. He got there. But you know what? After he got there, he still lived in tents. He still lived with an altar. He never built a house. Meaning, that even though he has arrived at that earthly promised land, he realized that is still something temporary. Amen. That is not the final and true promised land. Amen. So it says what? He sought a city with foundations. Amen. It said that they what? They looked for a better country. And they eagerly await what God has prepared for them, Amen. that other country. And then in, in chapter 12 in Hebrews, it talks about, and we've been, we have come to what? Mount Zion, am I right? Yeah. Heavenly Jerusalem. Amen. And in chapter 13, even at the very end of this book, it talks about we should be seeking that which is to come, which is this. So, because this word is kind of in me, ruminating, I just spoke something to Brother Dan. I said, Brother Dan, we look for a better country, Amen. a city with foundation, the heavenly Jerusalem. Amen. We seek that which is to come. I said, Brother Dan, 
we are people of faith and we are people of hope. Amen. And after that, I say, be minded, I pray. So with that thought, I prayed. I tell you, brothers, if I have not allowed this word huh, to dwell in, in me a little bit, I go there, I have nothing to say. I'll just say, how do you feel better? Wish you feel better, it's, it's gonna be okay. No. Nothing wrong with that. But do you know what I mean? But I went there a little bit, I, I, I'm not boasting, I'm just sharing my testimony, a small little testimony. I went there, uh, what? Almost admonishing, am I right? Did you follow me? almost exhorting. I went there with the word of ministry to my dear brother. And there's nothing more I can give him at this point in time than that. Words of comfort, words of consolation from the human source can only go so far. But the word of God, but not just the word in my memory, but the word that has found some space, some room in my being. That word, let me tell you, the indwelling word is the functional word. The word that has not yet dwelt in you does not work so well. The word of God is living and operative. Why is it not so operative in your life? I mean, look at this Bible. This wonderful Bible. How come it's not so operative yet still in my life? The problem is not this word. The problem is this word has not dwelled in you richly. In all wisdom. And coming back to, oh my goodness, coming back to Brother Howard, I just, I mean, yeah, so he's Hawaiian, he write Hawaiian songs or whatever. But that's not the point, is it? It's, it's, the word is in him so much that he has to, that outlet. You see? is in songs and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with his heart to the Lord. You know, Albert Lee, in speaking about this word, says this, that the singing of the word helps the word to inhabit you. Did you just hear that? How many of you have read the word and prayed the word and received the word and digest the word to such a point a song comes out? Now, when a song comes out of you, it's starting to dwell. Amen. You know, in this, uh, before the pandemic, actually this decade, I started to write songs, a lot of songs. And I know it's not easy to write, write a hymn, really, up to standard song. But I can tell you one thing, that it's not how smart I am, how, how musical I am. Or, you know, I, I will tell you, if you sit next to Brother Witness Lee, he cannot sing. He wrote all these wonderful hymns, he cannot sing. He tried, but he cannot. Another per person who is a terrible singer, who could not sing, his name is Benson Phillips. You sit next to them, they couldn't carry a tune. It's nothing like, they don't know what pitch is, okay? But it's not that. You can sing a melody that no one appreciates or understands, but it comes from your heart, Amen. where this word has found room to dwell. Amen. Today, you know, you take all your time taking in the news, going to Instagram, TikTok. I don't know where you go. You fill your heart, you fill your being, you let these things dwell in you instead of the word of Christ. No wonder, no wonder there's no song in your mouth. No wonder there's no teaching, there's no exhorting, there's no overflow and ministry to others 
for the edification of the saints and the building up of the church. So you see, brothers and sisters, if we want a genuine church life, a rich and strong church life, we've got to start here again. And that is all of us every day let this world. Spend the time in the Word. You know the Word the Lord used to, if anyone would eat me, even he shall live because of me. That word eat, I checked out again. Brother, he used the word masticate. Masticate. Masticate is not just eating. It's not licking. For sure. As masticate means chew. You munch, you crunch, you grind, you chomp. It, 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 it's, a, it's a very strong kind of word. It's, it's like a dog gnawing a bone. You know, have you seen a dog gnaw a bone? Like, there's nothing else left. He's still going for it, going at it. He's still trying to suck the last bit of marrow or whatever it is. That kind of, that is the word. If anyone will do that to me, my blood and flesh. But of course, the Lord then said, obviously this is not his physical blood and flesh. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and life. Eat my word. Masticate my word. Chew my word. Chew the cut like the four stomach Cow, ruminate, that's where the word ruminate comes from. Ruminate, regurgitate, you bring it up again, you eat it again, you digest it again. I tell you, this food gets simulated, that gets into you, and that is the remaining word. Oh, church in Long Beach, be that church. Be that church. I tell you, your meeting life will just go like this. I tell you, the gospel will go out. Oh, all the wonderful functions, the word washes, the word builds, the word sanctifies, the word perfects, the word, all kinds of things, they will, they, they, they will literally, literally change the church life, change the complexion of the church life. So I think this is good enough. I like to still leave some time for you to respond. I won't get into the matter of prayer tonight but do remember these three things okay yeah. let the word of the peace of christ arbitrate in our hearts let the word of christ dwell in us richly and what persevere in prayer i stop here maybe you can still have some response is that okay yeah Amen. hallelujah now it's your turn 60 seconds apiece. Uh, we'll, we'll go till uh, five minutes after, so about 10 minutes for prophesying. So, amen. For 10 years, I worked in the courthouse in the arbitration and mediation uh, office. And there are two kinds of arbitration. There is an arbitration that after the uh, arbitrator hears it, and renders his award, you have 30 days to accept it or reject it. But there's another kind of arbitration and it's called a binding arbitration. No matter what the arbitrator says, you accept it. So we, we, when, we, uh, when we come to the Lord to, and the Lord, start, uh, his peace is working to arbitrate, we're gonna have to sign it and say, this is binding. Amen. I have no choice, I just have to say, amen. Amen to the arbitrating peace. Amen. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Appreciate these three words, these three lines. Let the peace of Christ arbitrate in your heart. Amen. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Amen. Persevere in prayer. Amen. 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 Peace of the Lord be with you, brothers and sisters. Amen.
Thank you, Brother Minor, for bringing us more peace. The New Jerusalem is the foundation of the peace. I, I took the habit every day to read the Bible with the, the outlines and the every read, reading in order to be ready to speak the people outside. We cannot preach the gospel if we don't know what we're saying. It, these are the last days, brothers. It's not, we are just, we don't have to lose our time. We need to be ready for the Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you for Brother Minora come here tonight. Uh, he's uh, speaking a very important and a crucial word for all of us tonight. One thing, you know, we are just getting out of the pandemic. So let us not look backward. Amen. Let's look forward. Amen. Church in Long Beach, a genuine church. Amen. Church in Torrance, a genuine church. Amen. Church in Cerritos, a genuine church. Amen. We have to declare that, even though we are still weak, but in God's eyes, we are genuine. Amen. How can we be genuine? This is a very important thing. Let. Right. Let. Amen. You know, you're not charging us tonight, Abraham. You have to. You must be. Today, tonight, I receive the word. Let. Let the peace of Christ arbitrate in our heart. Praise the Lord. Um, I really appreciate this word. You know, it's such a practical word for us that are just in the church life, endeavoring to, endeavoring to serve the Lord. This matter of let the peace of Christ arbitrate. And like, realizing that this let is not a passive let, but it's an aggressive let. And I don't know how many times you, we have, you know, we all experience this where something frustrates us, you know, and it's so easy to stand, stay in our feelings and our frustration instead of turn to the Lord and just let the Lord just have it, you know, just give it to him. It's fine if there's no solution, you know, um, which is fine because we don't live again by the tree of right or, right or wrong. You know, we live by life and the Lord just sometimes wants us to just let the things go. Amen. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, Amen. singing. Amen. I love this topic of singing the word. Amen. Uh, I was reading life studies uh, for a period of time uh, before the promotion uh, in, the, in not too far past. And I would get to the point where I couldn't understand what I just read. And I thought, I need to turn this into some kind of a, 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 a well, I wouldn't say a hymn, but a song that I could digest the word in a in a richer way. And uh, so I just, uh, I think singing would let the word, if you try to make a song out of it, let the will help the word to dwell in us richly. Amen. I like to arbitrating us, uh, to let these persons settle the dispute, the inner differences. Um, and I was just thinking that actually this is an inner thing, it's not just something outward, um, because there's a lot of things that rise in our, in our being, you know. Um, the more we are together, the more we anyways pursue the Lord together. Um, but we can tell the Lord, Lord, I am thrown you. What Brother Monero said about singing songs to the Lord was 100% right. One time I was at Brother Howard Akashi's house and we were having a college meeting. There was about 60 college students in there. And in our college students talked. You couldn't even hear yourself think. 
Brother Howard, he was fine. He just picked up his guitar, walked to the center of the room, sat down, closed his eyes, and started singing love songs to the Lord. And when he did that, the whole place was dead silent, just looking at him because his eyes were closed and he was looking up, singing those love songs that he loved to write to the Lord. Lord, I just love you. And it just, oh, it just, you, the, 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 you can see the tears in those college students' eyes just looking at Howard because he was in so touch with the Lord with his songs and he's just looking up. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Brother Mineral, for opening these three verses to us. Tonight, this, these three verses are new to me. It opened my eyes. And in Colossians 3, 15, it says, Let the peace of Christ arbitrate in your hearts. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Lord, may we allow you to arbitrate your peace, arbitrate in our hearts. May we allow your word to dwell in us richly. Uh, like Karen mentioned, I just so appreciate this matter of the, the word let being uh, an aggressive let. Right. We don't let anybody do anything passively. Right. We have to be, especially with letting the peace arbitrate and letting the word dwell richly, we need to be so active, Amen. so aggressive. Uh, I love the word, we have to go after it. Uh, and, if, and particularly, I appreciated this matter of how do we let the Lord make his home in our heart practically. Practically, it's by letting the word dwell in us richly to the, to the extent that it takes over our inner parts. Amen. May this be the foundation of our new beginning. Amen. A very active, aggressive letting. Amen. Uh, going after the word until it takes over our inward parts. Amen. 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 The primary thing we need to have a genuine church life right. is to let the peace of Christ arbitrate in our hearts. Amen. Saints, this peace is the most important thing. Right. I really appreciate that this peace is, on the one hand, it's, it's vertical. We need to have peace with God. Right. And on the other hand, we also need to have peace with, with one another. Amen. And when we take care of this peace, when we let this peace arbitrate in our hearts, when we let this peace be the judge, be the arbitrator. Right. Then we can then we can have peace with God and with one another, and we can finally live a proper and genuine church life. Amen. And this is how we are led to have a new beginning. Amen. To live a church life that, that is in the body life. Amen. So maybe maybe let maybe let this peace arbitrate Amen. in our hearts. Amen. Amen. Just to go uh, along with uh, uh, Brian. The first thing to have the genuine church life is to let the peace of Christ arbitrate in your heart. And as a, a recent married brother, I can testify that, you know, we, we need to practice to be aggressively let the peace of Christ arbitrate in your heart. Amen. First thing on marriage, because this is the miniature of the church life. Amen. And I can testify if I don't have peace with my wife, I can serve the church. Amen. So uh, it's even more intensified in our living that we need to seek this peace Amen. who is just Christ himself Amen. so that we can have a peaceful marriage life peaceful Christian life and then peaceful church life Amen. I appreciate our brother's word that we're not going back to the pre-pandemic church life but we're going forward Amen. praise the Lord for the way to become more of a genuine church life by letting the peace of Christ arbitrate in our hearts and letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly. It seems to me these two go together. Sometimes uh, it's tough to let the empire have the final word until I let his word dwell in me. Amen. As he dwells in me, I get to say amen to his word. Amen. Praise the Lord for the way to go on, uh, not uh, just licking the word, but 
chowing down on the word. Amen. Amen. Having the word dwell in us richly. May this be uh, our experience in the churches who are visiting us as well. Okay, uh, we'll stop here tonight. We'll uh, come back again tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. for a short Lord's Table of about half an hour and then give some time for our brother uh, to speak from the outline that he prepared. Amen? Amen. I'll stop here. Thank you for coming. Please, uh, thank you for all the food. If you brought a dish, please go into the room and pick up your dish and take it home. Thank you.